Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Sorry about the delay between videos, but I just thought, you know what? You had so many videos in such a short space of time last week that you were probably sick of this face. So I thought, you know what? I'll take a few evenings off. Headed off to Wimbledon, still managed to get caught up in chaos on a day off. This time it wasn't Spurs chaos going on, it was actually chaos at Wimbledon with three different protesters running across the court that I was on. It was only, I wasn't actually on the court, but I sat beside it. It was only an outside court as well, number 18. But uh, still managed to find myself right in the thick of the action. Uh, but there you go. But I'm back. And the re, well, because I've left it so long since the last one, I think it's, is it a week? It's six days, seven days. Um, it means we've got lots to talk about. Um, so apologies if this is a long one, um, and I think during the time that I'm going to be doing this, we're probably going to, I think there's going to be an announcement from Spurs on the women's team as well, so I shall keep an eye out for that as well, so we can get that in there as well. Um, where to start? Where to start? So much to talk about. There's players, there's potential new signings, there's Postacoglu's first week of pre-season, there's Scott Munn issues... Do you know what? Let's start with the thing that just happened pretty much before I started recording this. Uh, match day ticket prices. Um, they've gone up. <laughs> There's no other thing else to say. They've gone up quite steeply in a few cases, um, or maybe all cases. I think it was like 15 20% increase. It's not good. I'll tell you what. What we'll start with, the Tottenham Hotspur Supporters Trust put out a statement. I'll read that very quickly. We're aware of the club's plans to increase match day ticket prices for the 23-24 season. Our ticketing team was informed of the plans to increase match day pricing on Friday morning. That is this morning. The club is aware that the trust lobbied for a price freeze on all match day pricing and having been informed this morning, we along with the wider fan base have been told rather than consulted. This must change if dialogue is to happen and supporter input is genuinely desired. It is in great timing with the announcement of the uh, the uh, fans onto the board recently, uh, the fans advisory board. It's yeah, it's you know me and, and the way Spurs carry themselves. It's it's never great. Sorry, continue with the statement. Um, the club knows that this is something the trust cannot support, and we feel an increase of this magnitude is excessive. Our match tickets are already amongst the most expensive in the Premier League and fans should not have to dig further into their pockets when they are already seeing their living standards squeezed by the cost of living crisis. We're also made of, aware of plans to move Newcastle United from a Category B to a Category A game and Nottingham Forest from Category C to Category B. The split was previously 5 Category A, 9 Category B and 5 Category C. From next season it will now be 6 Category A, 9 Category B and 4 Category C. We will now be looking closer at the breakdown of increases across all price points and will then calculate the additional income this will generate for the club. Whilst we recognise the increased operational costs and lack of European revenue for this coming season, we believe there are other ways the club can generate this lost revenue. This burden should never be pushed onto match-going supporters. Got to agree. Got to agree, absolutely. Um, look, the club are kind of trying to make it clear that some clubs have increased season ticket prices as well as match day ticket prices. They have only done one of those. Obviously, they froze the second season ticket. I don't know why I keep calling second season ticket prices. Um, but let's be honest, this can only look like they're trying to claw back money from doing so. Um, and obviously, with the cost of living crisis, I, I agree. With, I think that last line is a very good line from the trust statement. This burden should never be pushed onto match going supporters. And I agree with that, absolutely. Um, and look, it's going to quite rightly only intensify Spurs fans saying, well, OK, you're pushing us to give you more money, then you should be spending more money on transfers. I can understand where that's all going to come from now. And this is the issue with it. Um, and obviously the, the statement refers to not having European revenue next season, but that is as a result of some of the decisions taken by the club themselves. So, again, it's not the fans' fault. But, uh, yeah, I saw those coming out and it was not great. Not good at all. Um, I saw a couple of people saying that, yeah, tickets... Well, it is. It's, it's, some of those tickets have gone up 20%, which is it's such a bad look. 
it is such such a bad look um yeah there's not really much more i can say about it it's, it is what it is it, it's not great obviously i'll continue to mention it in reports and when things aren't going well that will be referred to of course it will and, and if they're not going to spend on um on transfers or, or go that extra mile on transfers people will obviously bring that up and, and obviously we all as journalists will refer to it so if it's a season when uh if it's a season that everyone loves and the postcogly football is amazing then maybe it is something that people will take into account as a better season but to put those prices up before knowing whether that is the case, it's a tough call. And it, and it is at a time when people are just, you know, as a, we know, not happy with the way the club's being run. It's just, it's just not a good look. It isn't a good look. There's nothing positive about it. The club will obviously say, you know, well, we need this money. We need this money to then go out and, and buy the players and whatever and increase wages. But then there has to be evidence that they're going to do that. So it only increases the scrutiny on the final, what have we got, two months just under of the transfer window. So, yeah, we shall see what happens with that. Scott Munn, next one. You will see that I think myself and Matt Law went out exactly pretty much the same time, I think. We both obviously got the information on this and both second sourced it. Scott Munn was meant to start on July the 1st as Tottenham's new chief football officer. He did not, officially did not officially start as a chief football officer. That is because there's been delays on the city end. It has not worked out as Spurs announced it would, and he is yet to start. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're not aware who Scott Money is, he has been the chief executive officer of the City Football Group China since 2019, previously worked in Australia for the City Group, um, meant to start, like I say, last Saturday, the same day as Ange Postacoglu was starting, um, he is going to be Daniel Levy's number two in essence and again always makes me think of um, Austin Powers and the club confirmed in their statement that he was going to take charge of all football departments. However, delays at the city end have made that he is not able to take up that role officially yet and at the moment it's unclear exactly when he's going to take that role up. I presume that's because they will continue to negotiate it, I guess. But as of now, he has not officially begun his role. Um, again, not a great look. Because, you know, especially to have announced when someone's going to start and they don't actually start on that date is not good at all. Ah, Tottenham Hotspur. Um, obviously, you'd be daft to think that he's not being consulted on many things going forward. It just means, obviously, that Spurs presumably will not be paying him until um, the time that, that his, his contract can officially begin. But certainly, in terms of consultation, I know that he is he's being spoken to about things that are going to take place. It's a natural thing in, in any kind of new job you're coming into, I guess. And yeah, So, Scott Munn. It's a shame, really, in a way, because we were going to... Um, hoping to uh, get an interview with him out in Australia during the tour. So obviously that's not going to happen unless something is rapidly sorted out in the next... When do they leave Australia? 21st? Is it 21st? Yeah, game's on the 18th, isn't it? So, yeah, unless happens something happens in the next two weeks, I'm not going to get that interview. But it'll come at some point, maybe. Yeah, just like the Fabio Paratici one did. <sighs> Communication, eh? Tottenham Hotspur, eh? Aren't they great at it? Um, yeah, so that's Scott Munn. That's season ticket. Sorry, not season ticket. Match day ticket prices. Um, some f forward steps in recent weeks. And today, a couple of backward steps. It wouldn't be Tottenham Hotspur if you weren't... Uh, things weren't con con constantly stumbling and tripping over and going back a few steps. That's just the way things work. Um, what else? Oh, there was another thing that potentially could go wrong as well, is that it looks maybe increasingly likely, certainly the Italian media reporting so, that Roma could be pulling out of the third friendly in Spurs tour. So if you're not aware where Spurs are heading off to, Perth in Australia, Bangkok in Thailand and then Singapore. Uh, the Singapore game was meant to be against Jose Mourinho's Roma, 
Um, Spurs played Roma a fair few times in pre seasons, and it was meant to happen again. Um, when was it? 26th? Yeah, 26th. They're meant to be playing them at Singapore National Stadium, kicking off at half 12 lunchtime, UK time. Um, however, La Gazzetta della Sport have been reporting that uh, Roma are set to cancel their entire tour to East Asia, including an earlier game in Korea, South Korea as well. Um, from what Gazzetta della Sport are claiming a missed payments from the organiser, I think from the Korea part of the tour, I think. I'm trying, I can't remember exactly what they were saying in their reports, but it seems to be the suggestion. Um, and presumably the feeling is, well, they're not just going to go all the way to Singapore for one game. I'm guessing that's, that's the way they're looking at it. So from what I understand from the Spurs side of things, they've had no issues with their tour promoters or organisers or anything. Um, and they're likely, if that is the scenario that Roma pull out, that they will face a new opponent there. However, at this late notice, I do wonder who that's going to be, because most clubs will have their pre-season plan set already by now. I do wonder whether you end up having to play some kind of local eleven, which is not great preparation, let's be honest. Um but, you know, again, you've got till the 26th, so what's that, 19 days for the organisers to find someone else if Roma do pull out. So you could do with the best opposition possible, really. Um, I know it's not about results and things like that, but just to have, let's, you know, someone that you're going to be up against and who is constantly pressing you let's say or, or replicate replicate some of the Premier League opponents you're going to get obviously we've Spurs have got West Ham and Leicester in the first couple of games um you want someone who is going to replicate the the faster paced nature or one of the early ca um candidates teams you're going to come up against so yes I shall wait with bated breath to see who I were reporting on in Singapore um Pretty sure, yeah, 2019 when I was there with Spurs, it was Juventus. And we got that amazing Harry Kane from the halfway line goal um, against Chesney, wasn't it? In, um, in the Juventus goal. One of the best goals I've ever seen, and it came in a friendly. Um, but yeah, we shall wait to see. So yeah, three things today. Not the greatest in the whole scheme of Tottenham Hotspur things. Um, I should stress, not official yet, and you know it may well be that something changes, but certainly the Italian media outlet are going very strongly on it. Um, let's talk about positive things. <laughs> After that little hat-trick of horror, let's talk about positive things. Um, and Postacoglu has had a really impactful first six days at the moment it'll be a week for those of you watching this on Saturday but a very impressive start to life at Tottenham Hotspur from everyone I've spoken to this is um so what happens just to kind of point this behind the scenes thing of how a journalist works so throughout the early weeks and months uh, especially after the first week me personally I go out and I absolutely talk to every contact possible, whether it be anyone working within a club or working with people who are within a club, whether it's people around players, staff, whatever you want to call it, or whoever you want to talk about. God, that was a terrible sentence. Essentially, yeah, trying to get an absolute all-round view on a new manager and how they're being um, taken, what they're like, because the key is, let's be honest, if you're just going to go to official type channels, you're going to get a very happy, rosy view. Um, if you try and speak to everyone, and also I try to speak to people involved with players who may not be a first choice, um, who might be potentially a fringe player, players who maybe might leave, um, academy players as well. Just literally anyone I can speak to around anyone. Uh, just to get this full view of stuff, a better, clearer picture. And I have to say, although to be fair, I think this was similar with Conte. With Nuno, there were a couple of interesting different views. Um, I think Jose was pretty much positive all round. The, the thing what I, that I would say with Jose and Antonio Conte was that you're asking people after a tough time about a new presence coming in. 
and that is always likely to be uh, one of happiness, not happiness, but one of being impressed because it's a fresh new voice, it's new thinking, it's, and that's not to do down what they did because obviously Jose and Antonio Conte both picked up Spurs, you know, quite quickly, but obviously there is an element of they've been in the depths. I guess you could argue maybe that that is also what's happened a bit with Postacoglu coming in uh, because of the way the season ended, but certainly Ryan Mason had improved the atmosphere and the mood around the club. So he's not having to pick people off the floor like uh, Conte and Mourinho were. But, going back to my original point, it's all very, very positive, which is good to hear. You know, when you're getting kind of people of any experience, uh, players of senior and junior, and you're hearing the same at all levels, that can only be a good thing, can't it? I think it has to be. Um, he's made a very strong, very clear impression on on the players and the staff alike. Um, obviously, if you're not aware, he's working with a big group of non-international players so far. The international players will start rocking up from probably Monday onwards, unless they want to come in a little bit earlier. But it's likely to be Monday onwards, uh, staggered, bearing in mind they get contracted 21 days after their last international match. Um, whether they were playing or not, if they were involved in any way with the squad, uh, the international squad, then they get 21 days. But they don't have to stick to that. The club have to stick to that, as in in terms of they can't order them to come back earlier. But players can decide, and there are going to be a few that we'll talk about who I think are going to do that. Um, and the makeup of pre-season, what happens is, first day, certainly a chunk of it is taken up with the fitness tests and checking where the players are. But what I think you find nowadays is that because the players keep themselves in such a good uh, state and they have training programs to adhere to from the club staff, they come back in such a good place that essentially often now, even on the first day, they can get the ball out and start getting on the training pitches already, which is good for Postacoglu because he wants to get that um, whole mentality and his philosophy straight in. Sorry if you ever see me kind of itching during this one, but at the moment, because it's hot, I think there must be thunderstorms coming. We've got loads of these little black thunderfly things. Um, and when you have a bug, a bug, when you have a beard, they are probably one or two have, have snuck in there somewhere. Um, or if they probably, or if they haven't, I think they're in there and it makes you go a bit paranoid. Um, sorry, diversion there. Back to Spurs. Um yeah, so they'll get out there on the pitches and they'll do stuff. And obviously, with his relentless attacking drills that he wants to get into them, they're going to have to very quickly get into all of that. Um, you know, I know we saw all the the videos of the the players arriving, and uh, yeah, Tongi um, Tongi doing his uh, <laughs> he's always got to make some kind of. Uh, create some kind of noise with Spurs fans. Um, it's just, uh, it's just the way he got out of the car, isn't it? And in every tiny detail when it comes to Tongi is overanalyzed. I mean, I saw a video just before I started this where he's sprinting up and down the pitch like a madman involved in a really good goal in training, and it's like, will people fixate on that? And that you know, he's he's done this terrific bit of kind of energy and fitness and all that. Probably not. It's just the way it works with Tongi, and I'm sure he is he is well aware of that. Um, absolutely well aware of that. I think we're getting close to the uh, the uh, potential Spurs ladies news. Um, which sorry, that's why I'm very slightly keeping an eye on um, on my laptop next to me as well because it's important that we also talk about the, the women's team as well because we have been waiting um, for women's team news as well which hopefully will come before I do this video. Otherwise, I'll tease something that hasn't even arrived yet. Um, but yeah, back to Postacoglu. Um, made a really quick positive impression with everyone. Players, staff, um, very strong communicator is one of the things I keep getting told. We know he kind of is, and we knew that beforehand, but actually hearing that he's taking place at Tottenham is a big thing. Um, leaves you with no doubt what is expected of you. Whether you are a coach or a player, whether you're a young player or an old player, or a member of just a staff behind the background, in the background, he lets you know very clearly what he wants and what he expects, and then it's down to you to deliver that. Um, 
yeah, he's, I think I've told you in the past that he likes to go into new clubs and, and tell a story to get his way across to his new players. And it sounds like that's very much what he's done at a, a group meeting, obviously, when he came in. And it sounds like that's that's the way he presented it and told the story about what they're going to become and, and what he wants from them and how they can achieve it. And I think the thing he often says is um, nobody ever created anything new without coming up against resistance and difficulties and, and people not believing that they can do it. But that's how you, you know, become something special by overcoming those sort of things and having this strong belief in what you're going to do. Um, and I think it's the same speech he, he does at each club. And, and I pretty much get the impression that's what he did again at Spurs. And again, everyone, everyone that spoke to around any of the players, those players have come away thinking, oh, yeah, you know, absolutely ready to kind of get to work for this guy. Um what other things have people tell me? I've written some of these down here as well. Um, training sessions. Um, upbeat, bright, some of the words that have been told. Very clear structure. Drills. I know they've had at least one full-sided match as well and with some of the academy players making up the numbers. Um, although it is a, pretty much an indictment of how bloated, how big the squad is, that actually when you look at the amount of first-team players, um, I think I've got them listed down here somewhere, even without the international players. So you've got Hugo Lloris, Yves Basuma, who Postacoglu loves. He's very quickly taken a shine to, Post uh, to Basuma. Although, to be fair, Mason and Wells, who are now obviously on his coaching staff, really, really liked Basuma. Um, and they would have no doubt been extolling his virtues. But then I think, from what I understand, Postacoglu is very quickly senior. He's a player for me. So, hoping that a big season for Basuma... Uh, Eric Dyer, uh, he joined in a little bit late. He joined in um, certainly Monday. And he's on a different bit of a programme because of his groin surgery that he had towards the end of the season. So slightly, um, yeah, different path he's taking. Pedro Porro, Emerson Real, obviously Tongu was speaking about. Jed Spence, although I don't think he's back in training yet after his knee injury. I think he is on his way back, but isn't quite there yet. Um, Brian Hill, Ryan Sessegnon, he's definitely taking part. I've seen him in a few things. Sergio Reguilon, Fraser Forster, Jaffet Tanganga, Alfie Devine, Dane Scarlett, Troy Parrott, Harvey White, Brandon Austin, and Alfie Whiteman. So that's a big group of players that are considered first team players before you even get to the academy ones coming in, let alone the international players who will start returning from next week. So you can see how huge that squad is. I mean, I haven't even thought about the number there, but you've got to be looking at high 30s there as the squad number. Coaches pretty much always want to work with around 25, which shows you the size of the cull that is going to have to happen in the coming weeks. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've always been there. It's just madness. And obviously, Rodrigo Bentenker has, has been back doing his rehabilitation as well as he works his way back. But um, yeah, the... Postacoglu's coaching staff have been very um, impressive so far as well. People have spoken about him, uh, uh, him, them. Um, what was the expression someone said? Um, brilliant. That was it. I'd written it down there. A uh, few people have used that word about how good this coaching staff is he's put together. Again, if you're not aware, senior assistant coach is Chris Davies, former Leicester Liverpool Celtic assistant coach, often worked with Brendan Rodgers. Um, loves his possession-based football. He will be the senior figure of that coaching staff. He will be the one that will help organise a lot of the drills, set them up under Postacoglu's guidance. Uh, and then you've got the assistant coaches, who are Ryan Mason, Matt Wells, I spoke about, and Mila Jedinak as well. And you've got the goalkeeping coach, Rob Birch. Um, so from what I understand, they've been had it already made very clear to them what Postacoglu wants. His beliefs fit in quite well with what they want anyway. Um, and they've been kind of given a little bit of autonomy to then go out there and make that happen. And what you'll find is that uh, they'll be given groups of like uh, kind of little key groups of players that they will work with um, a lot, whether it ends up being position based or whatever or age-based maybe I don't know but they certainly will be given groups and they'll be responsible for them it, and then with Postacoglu overlooking it all what he actually does um, I think I've said this before when we talk about before he came he does is not a guy that really gets into training sessions and goes oh you go there you go there that his idea is that before a training session 
he will very clearly state what he wants from the training session, what the players are expected to do, and then they will go out and do that. He doesn't really want to interrupt a training session. Um, he will occasionally interject, but mainly you'll see him prowling around the edges, watching from afar, writing stuff in his notebook, and then he kind of knows what he wants to do and, and what he needs to tweak for the next session as well. He just doesn't want to to break up the session. His idea is that he wants the training sessions to reflect a match. Um, so they're often 60 to 70 minutes long, really intensive, relentless kind of sessions, lots of ball work, lots of one-touch, two-touch stuff. Um, and it, that 60, 70 mi minutes is to mirror the amount of time the ball is in play during a game. And yeah, that's kind of how they are. Pre-season they're going to be a little bit tougher than that. They're going to be longer, maybe 80, 90 minutes just to kind of get that into their legs and their body. But yeah, it's a lot of ball work. It's going to be different probably from what you would have seen under uh, Conte and maybe even Post uh, Pochettino as well. That yeah, all the focus is really on what they're doing with the ball while building up their fitness with the relentlessness of those sessions. Um, because obviously under Conte you had all these different fitness coaches, whereas now under Postacoglu it's more the sports science staff are dealing with the fitness. So yeah, be interesting to see how that works. They have to be fit to work his system. Uh, you'll very quickly see the ones who can't hack it. Um, it's kind of it naturally breeds its own fitness in a way. It's it's quite interesting. Obviously we've been used to Spurs that maybe are sitting back and doing the selective pressing, whereas under the Postacoglu uh, system, it's constant movement, it's constant pressing as well, quite a lot. So, constant is more than quite a lot, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah, so the coaching team getting a lot of um, praise as well. And actually, there was a nice little quote he said in the week I'm really pleased with the group of coaches I've got together. It's well chronicled that I don't have a traveling band of coaches, I like to work with new people. That excites me and challenges me as a person. I have a really good mix, bright young guys. It's been mentioned to me that apparently I'm getting a bit old, so I'm surrounding myself with younger guys, but more importantly, really bright, talented and ambitious guys. And that's the interesting thing. I think some people kind of thought, oh, you know, um, you know, all these people that want to be managers, they're going to be after his job, they're going to be undermining him. Obviously, Ryan Mason wanted the Spurs job, but kind of Postacoglu loves that. He loves people that are going to be kind of constantly challenging him and and uh, making him better and he will make them better in the process and from my understanding all the coaches are loving what they're doing Postacoglu so far so it is it, it's it's a really interesting way of doing it. I'm just double checking that Spurs haven't done their announcement yet because I think it was meant to be there we go so Tottenham Hotspur women have a new head coach it is Robert Villaham um just two year contract subject to a work permit um his previous is where's he come from he's come from head coach of the under night oh these names i'm gonna absolutely murder so it was a player at gothenburg and it was a sweet under 19s player um and he was a most recently assistant coach at bk hacking um yeah, so there you go. New lay, uh, Tottenham Hotspur women coach in place. Um, let's see what they do next season. Uh, just a very quick quote. Andy Rogers, managing director. Robert is an ambitious, dynamic and successful coach and we're excited to welcome him to the club ahead of the upcoming season. He has a track record of developing players to international level and competing for both domestic trophies and in the Champions League, demonstrating his ability to match our own ambitions and philosophy. Um, we shall confirm Robert's coaching staff in due course. So there you go. That was that announcement that has been done and dusted. It was interesting because as I was, I wanted to wait to the announcement, but I could see tweets saying, oh, you know, it might happen or there's a potential in the week it could happen. But I kind of knew that that announcement was coming. So I thought I'll wait until it's actually official. And there it is. So there you go. Good news for the women's team. They can now crack on, look forward and hopefully um, really get back on track in a women's Super League next season. Back to Postacoglu. Um, yeah, so I spoke to you about the training sessions. Uh, interesting, I've noticed the handshakes have returned. Um, who was it did the handshake? Was it, was it Poch? It was Poch that always did the handshakes. Um, yeah, Postacoglu does the handshakes um, with every player. 
don't know if it's at the start or the end of training sessions. Maybe it's both. Um, but yeah, I certainly saw him handshaking them all as they came off. And Tongi got two pats on the back. It means nothing. <laughs> Again, I'm not going to read into things like people do. But it's, uh, it's just funny. Um, what else? Not just on the pitch as well. I should stress people off the pitch as well. I've been speaking to those who kind of work within, kind of behind the scenes at Spurs as well. Um, what are some of the expressions I've had? Very strong communicator. Someone else told me polite, friendly, and um, straight to the point without being rude. That was another expression I, I wrote down speaking to people. I think the key thing is he's tried to bring all the departments in the club close together again and pulling in the same direction. Whereas I don't want to really disrespect Conte in any way because Conte is such a terrific coach and what he does is undoubted across the game. But certainly when it came to Spurs... There were some departments that maybe felt that they weren't as important to the running of things as others. Whereas, I think, I've said it before, Ryan Mason's come in and tried to repair a lot of that. And it feels like Postacoglu is now taking that on and, and doing similar. Um, the thing I kept hearing as well from most people is that he's very... Um, doesn't want to come across as a micromanager. He's not going to kind of put himself in everyone's business. He's got no interest in that. He kind of wants to be a leader who understands what people's roles are uh, and their responsibilities and then lets them crack on and do that. As long as he's happy with what the output output is and what it's meant to be, you crack on and you do that. And it's similar to his coaches, but he also believes that in other departments as well because obviously he's got to be kind of in charge a lot of this, especially while Spurs continue their search for their next uh, director of football, technical director, whatever you want to call it. Um, technical performance director. Oh, so many different titles it could end up being. Um, but yeah, yeah, so really positive influence on the players. Um, everyone connected with so many players, people around I've spoken to, and they've all come, come back with glowing stuff about the training sessions being really interesting. And just a general excitement about the kind of football, which is great. Um, but let's be honest, it's, you know, it's about what happens on the pitch uh, and the results, which we know they might be a little bit iffy to begin with. But it's going to be hopefully an improvement and enjoyment of what we do. But ultimately, he will be um, judged on his results. What else was I going to say about Posta or Something else was going to say as well. Um, oh, Academy. Yeah, Academy, he's been very good with everyone involved in the Academy so far. Academy staff, Academy players. Feels like there's a kind of a clearer pathway now for, to the first team and, and people know what's expected of them. Using lots of players from the Academy in the sessions. Um, Matthew Craig as well, I forgot to mention him. Matthew Craig and Niall John finally signed their new deals, which is fantastic. So they've been involved um, in the Postacog Group sessions, which is really good. Uh, Matthew Craig, terrific season last season. I'm really, I'm intrigued to see if he goes on the tour, whether he is one of those who actually uh, impresses. So, um, yeah, sorry, I was just looking at that as well as some more stuff about the um, the women's new coach. Um, yeah, yeah, really good, positive stuff, um, as it should be. It'd be a bit rubbish if he's coming in and everyone immediately disliked him. But I just don't get the impression he's that kind of guy. Um, there have been some really good interviews that have gone out so far. We've had the really long interview that I think went out was it the first day of pre-season. Um, and then we had a and a with the fans, which was really good. People did like little Zoom questions for him uh, with Milesy sitting alongside him, the, the club legend that is Milesy. Um, and, oh, sorry, if... I didn't make this clear. The under-21s came back two days before the first team. They came back on Thursday, first team from Saturday. Uh, so they've been in that little bit longer. Um, and then, yes, we shall wait to see the players coming back. Obviously, all the international players ahead of the tour should... I think we'll see probably all of them back, maybe barring Skippy. Um, Oliver Skip is in action tomorrow in the final of the European Under-21 Championships England against Spain um, he's then got a decision to make obviously does he return quite quickly to Spurs training without any real rest at all to try and make an impression on Postacoglu 
or does he take some more of a rest and maybe either join up later in the tour or not at all? Because technically, if he takes the 21 days from his game, I think he would come back on the 29th of July, which is when Spurs are back from their tour and they'll have landed. I think they'll fly back either the, I think the 28th and we'll be back on the 29th, I think, unless they go on the evening of the 27th. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, th I think I'm back on the 29th. So I'm presuming that could be... It's just such a long flight. Although saying that, it's back from Singapore. So it's not as long as it is going out there to Perth. Um, what else was I going to talk about? Oh, Destiny Doggy. Um, at the moment, the suggestions that I'm hearing um, from both sides, from Spurs and those around him, is that he may come back in time for the tour. Um he was with Italy at the Under-21 Championships, um, same championships for Skippy, but he, uh, Italy went out in the group stages. I think if he had adhered to the 21 days, he would be back maybe for the match in Thailand against Leicester. But there's a strong possibility at the moment that he will come back in time to head off on the tour itself. Um, you know, whether it ends up being a change to that, we'll see, but... That certainly seems to be an early indication. And I think I said before, with Sonny, they're going to make a decision on whether he flies directly from Korea to um, Perth, because otherwise he's coming on a long-haul flight all the way back to England, only for a day or two later to head back on a long-haul flight to Australia, which is not good for anyone, let's be honest, um, especially for a player preparing for the season ahead. Um, yeah, I was going to delve into a little bit some of these things with Postacoglu so, because there were some interesting little bits and pieces. The Q and A was really nice. Um, lots of the fans from around the world kind of got the chance to send in messages, um, and it was a good one. He was asked actually. It was a bit like ooh, when he was asked about um, Harry Kane and Sonny scoring lots of goals under him, um, and he said. Hopefully Harry and Sonny score bags of goals and they're not the only ones. It's still the bit of the game I love the most. There's no such thing as an ugly goal. Every single time that ball crosses the line, the emotion that that brings to people, I love it. It's still the best part of the game for me. How the goals go in, just the joy that it brings. It unites people, it unites strangers. It doesn't matter who you stood next to. When that ball crosses that line, you're hugging them. So hopefully the boys score bags of goals, but they're not the only ones. Um, yeah, obviously... It's the first chance for the new manager to talk about Harry Kane being in his team and scoring lots of goals. I, I, one person on Twitter, when I put that out, um, did say, oh, well, technically he's not saying scoring goals for Spurs, but why would he, why would he be talking about scoring goals for anyone else? Um, I think you have to understand that that's him talking about him scoring goals for him. Uh, when it comes to Kane, obviously, we still await to see exactly what's going to happen with him, but... From what the suggestions I, I'm getting is that certainly Spurs have offered him the opportunity to discuss a big new deal um, at the club to stay obviously beyond 2024. Um, from what I understand from the players' point of view, there's no rush right now to commit, certainly during this transfer window, um, because essentially he's got to assess the big picture and what the future holds and and that's many things that what are the club going to do in the transfer market? Are they going to seriously give him a chance to win trophies? Is Postacoglu exactly what he needs right now? How does his system work with him? Um, you would hope that the way Postacoglu has been with the other players and the impression they've got from him, that he will impress Kane as well when they talk next week. Certainly, Postacoglu has already spoken to Sonny by the sounds of it. I've got a quote here somewhere. Yeah. He said, because someone asked him about his relationship with Ferenki Puskas, who managed him at South Melbourne Hellas, I think it was. Um, and, yeah, because obviously Sonny won the Puskas Award for his amazing goal. Puskas Award is given out to the best goals of the season. And he actually said, well, actually... Uh, I already have a relationship with Sonny because he scored against me for Korea in the Asian Cup final. We were one minute away from winning it and Sonny scored. We got him in extra time. Um, and I've already said to him that he's forgiven for that. Um, so there you go. So he's already he's admitted himself that he's already spoken to Sonny. 
um, which is an interesting little thing. And it does just makes you wonder how these things happen. I know some people might say, well, why hasn't he spoken to Cain? But maybe there's an essence that, uh, or a case of just let Cain rest. Let's see what develops with Bayern Munich and whether they are going to come in with a really serious big offer for him or not. And whether that even becomes a discussion. Um, and then sit down with him and have a proper kind of thrashing out things next week and what's going to happen. So, uh, yeah, so that's the situation with Kane. It's it's kind of like a bit of a wait and see, isn't it? It's it's to see, a bit like with Man City, it's very kind of got vibes of 2021 in that are they actually going to, I guess, put their money where their mouth is? Are they going to come in with any kind of bid that even starts Spurs thinking about it? Because right now Spurs are just rejecting any notion out of hand that Kane's going to go. Um, it's down to Bayern to make a compelling case for why Spurs should consider that. Um, again, uh, I'm not even going to go into it. You know my thoughts on it. You know my thoughts of, if I'm Kane, I don't see why this summer's the one to go. In, in January, you've got your choice of any foreign club you want to sign a pre-contract with. Next summer, you've got any club in the world you want to sign a deal with. Or it also gives you the option of having a look at another 12 months. I know he's done more than enough for Spurs, absolutely. And, and he has carried them through many seasons. But Postacoglu could be something different. I've just got this funny feeling that Spurs are going to win a domestic cup this summer. I, I, sorry, this season. I don't know why. Um, I just feel like it'll be the one season when maybe you'd least expect it. And it's like a rebuild season that actually that happens. I think, didn't Poch get to the Carabao Cup final his first season, maybe. Um, I'm trying to remember if Redknapp did in the first season or second as well. But yeah, I, I just got this funny feeling. It's one of these where if it's all great and it happens, I can come back to this and go, ooh, Gould said it there. Um, and if it doesn't, we'll just ignore it. Um, but yeah, this interview was really interesting with Postacoglu, these little kind of Q&A. Um, there was one fan asked him about, you know, Will it be uh, worth me kind of getting up in the middle of the night to watch Spurs like I always do? Um, <clears throat> and his answer was really good. He said, Postacoglu, I know that experience as well because it was my upbringing as well. I love that. And some of my best memories were getting up in the middle of the night and watching games on the other side of the world. It helps if they are positive experience. So that's my responsibility with that. That's how I know that when we do these pre-season trips, they're really important. Our supporters, just because they're not here watching us every week, it takes a hell of a lot of passion and commitment to the club to get up every time in the middle of the night and sometimes midweek to watch your team play. I guarantee you that you won't be falling asleep watching our games, irrespective of the time of the day. That's a guarantee. That's a, really, that's a nice quote. That's what we all want to hear. Again, I know it's just words. But certainly the way his teams have played every point of his career, I don't think we're going to have to worry about the style of football. It's just going to be how he deals with the rigours of the Premier League and the just a higher level, I guess, of, of tactical uh, battle that he's going to have as well. So um, I thought that was a good one. There was a long quote about um, more important than a winning mentality he actually feels it's believing in something. He says lots of people talk about winning mentality, but he said everyone wants to win. Everyone what goes into a match wanting to win the match. He, he kind of almost doesn't really believe that that's a thing. He said it's more if you've got a set belief and a very strong belief in what you and how you want to play and what you want to achieve, he said naturally that will feed into a winning uh, I guess mentality <laughs> um, because... If you've got an unshakable belief in how you're doing things, that's stronger than people who are simply going into a game trying to win it. And I kind of get what he means. He spoke about the formation as well. He said, yes, in the overall of his career, if you look at it, it's mostly been a 4-3-3. But what he would stress is that you in a game will very rarely see a 4-3-3, he said, because his system is also very fluid. Um, so that's going to be fascinating for us as journalists to kind of see. It's kind of the case in football, to be honest. Every team, how they set up, is rarely how you actually see them. Often, there's different formations for when you're in possession, out of possession as well. Um, I'm really looking forward to the, the opening games and seeing exactly how how it all works. Um, what else did he say? He had said, oh, his mentality and beliefs. This is a bit of a longer one, but I think it might be nice to read. Just, just very quickly, apologies for story time with Alistair. Um, 
I think the major thing about my journey and my football career as a manager is that really early on, I had this part of me that just decided that my teams were going to play a certain way, irrespective of the league I was in, the challenge I had before me in terms of whatever club I was picking up and whatever state they were in. I needed my teams to play in a certain way for me to really feel like it was my team. I've been non-negotiable in that the whole way and made the decision really on in my career that this is the kind of manager I'm going to be and this is how my teams are going to play. Along the way, when I've had times when it could have gone either way, me sticking to my core beliefs and values have allowed me to get through those moments and have success. It's not just about regretting if you don't. It's that people will then believe in you more because they see that you're not doing it for any other reason than that. Is what, and that reason is it is what you confirm in your mind and what you know will get you to where you want to go. People will see that never wavers, even in the most extreme of pressure. People will know you're saying what you really believe, not just saying it because you saw somebody else do it or someone else told you to do it. It's an extension of who you are. And to me, my teams and how they play are an extension of me as a person. People are never in any doubt whether they're around me or working with me that this is not going to change. It's how we're going to be. I like that. I like that. You can tell. I I'm sold on Postico Glue. I absolutely am. And I really, really want him to be able to implement what he can do. If he does, and he has that little pa bit of patience from myself and other journalists and the fans, I think he can do it. But we're a fickle bunch. I, I include myself in this. We, we kind of preach patience and then analyse and criticise things that happen immediately. Um, and that is the way it works. And I understand that. It, again, I can only go back to the old cliche. It is a results-based business, and he will have less time at Spurs probably than any club previously. You know, even at Celtic, it was a bit rocky to begin with. They went out of the Champions League in the qualifying stages. Um, but there was a general acceptance that he'd taken on a bit of a mess there, needed a big rebuild, and the football was good quite early on. Um, maybe you could see parallels with Spurs, that they were in a bit of a mess in terms of finishing eighth in the league, um, the the squad is a bit of a bloated one needs sorting out and hopefully fans starved of good football will at least turn to that and be excited by the attacking movement and some of the goals that we've scored who knows, it may go completely the other way and they may just click it might be one of those few occasions in his career where the club have just been ready for him and bang, they've gone straight in hitting the ground running we'll see We'll see. I'm not entirely sure if that is going to happen, but we'll see. So back to transfers. What else? Mana Solomon, uh, likely to be in next week before they head off on the tour. Um, yeah, there was a lot of talk about him coming in, doing medicals and being in England. But anyone who's kind of watching his Instagram story could see that he is out um, kind of having one of those, like the footballers do, like a part holiday, part um, training camp with their fitness coach. So... Yeah, it looks like he'll be in next week to do that. Obviously, if you're not aware of the situation behind Mana Solomon, so turns 24 later this month, Israeli international, he was playing with them, which is why he's got that little bit longer as well. He's playing with them last month. He will arrive on technically a free transfer, although I'd imagine there'll be some smoothing over to be done with Shakhtar Donetsk and FIFA, because if you're not entirely aware again of his situation, so... Solomon was on loan at Fulham last season. Um, he did have a contract with Shakhtar until the end of this year, 2023. However, any non-Ukrainian player playing in Ukraine because of uh, the Russian invasion into Ukraine, FIFA allowed a suspension of contracts. I think that was actually done a second time. I think it was increased. Either way, the suspension was going to extend beyond the end of Solomon's contract at Shakhtar Donetsk, which means that technically he will be a free player, or is because of the suspension. Um, obviously, you would have seen the Shakhtar, one of the higher-ups, I can't remember if it was president or owner, was very vocal um, in the media a couple of weeks back that if Spurs did do that, that you know, they would sue them and all that sort of stuff. I would imagine the fact that he's moving ahead suggests that they're kind of that is being smoothed over. Excuse me. And interestingly, they are playing Shakhtar in a friendly on um, August the sixth at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium as well. It would seem strange to have sorted all of that out with a club that you're not on the best terms of. Um, 
Yeah, if, you, if you're not aware, Spurs announced last week, wasn't it, that this friendly match will make a financial contribution and an additional donation of net proceeds from ticket sales to Shakhtar Social, which has provided financial support, humanitarian and medical assistance to children and families across Ukraine since the conflict began. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. And hopefully um, a good kind of little preview chance for Spurs fans at um, the Spurs Stadium to see Postacoglu's team. I do. I wonder whether that will be like one of the best attended ever Spurs preseason games, as in, sorry, a home game. I'm trying to think how many have taken place actually at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Oh, do tell me in the comments. I'm trying to remember even if there was one. There must have been one, although it opened and then quite swiftly you had uh, the pandemic, didn't you, afterwards? So maybe there hasn't been. So it could end up being the best attended one. Um, ah, it'll be it'll be good. It'll be good. Um, so Mana Solomon, let's talk about him. Uh, what are Spurs getting with Mana Solomon? So they're getting a, a young player, uh, plenty of experience despite his age. He's played in the Premier League, Champions League, Europa League, FA Cup. Internationals, he's played 33, sorry, 35 appearances he's made for Israel, scored seven goals. He's a tricky little winger with a bit of acceleration, bit of skills on the ball. Definitely needs to improve his output, and especially in terms of assists, I'd say. A little bit of a Lucas Mora feel in that looking over his numbers, definitely could have provided more assists from with the ability he's got. And, and we'll have to see. Maybe he steps up with the... Um, with the players around him at Tottenham Hotspur. What I would say that when it comes to his goals, he seems to be a player for the big occasion. If you look at his goals in the Champions League, he scored against Man City, scored against Real Madrid twice, scored against Atalanta as well. Obviously not the same level as those two, but it does give you the general impression that he does rise to the occasion. In the Premier League, I think I've written it down, scored against Brighton, Brentford, Wolves and Forest, and in the FA Cup against Leeds. He had this great little run where he scored in five games in a row. Um, because what happened with him last season was a bit of a difficult one for him. He made his debut against Liverpool in the opening game of the season. Then he, in a training ground friendly, a behind closed doors thing, he picked up a really, like, kind of annoying knee injury that actually kept him out all the way until, I think it was January, wasn't it? I would have written down here. Yeah, mid-January against Leicester he came back. So he had to kind of slowly build up his confidence in his knee, give him little bits of game time, um, and he was kind of unleashed in like fits and bursts from the bench against tired defences. And then he had, like I say, this run of five games in a row where he scored. A um, couple of them you'll have seen absolutely beautiful cutting inside, curling efforts. It's almost like the, a bit like Sonny, I guess. It's more like Sonny, like the reverse of what uh, Kuliszewski has done on a few occasions. He's right-footed, mostly plays on the left, although he can play centrally and on the right. But mostly he's on the left, cuts in, uses his right foot. Um, and actually had a little stat here. He used the, became the first Israeli to score in three or more consecutive Premier League fixtures since Ronnie Rosenthal in 1992, although that was while he was at Liverpool before he'd come to Tottenham. Um, Ronnie Rosenthal. What a, what a cult legend he was. Um, what I would say, you know, obviously you've got to look at both sides of this. After that glut of goals, he did not become a regular at Fulham. He was still in and out of the team. Um, but it seems like Silver, Marco Silva did want to keep him, um, only for Spurs to kind of come into the picture. Um, so, yeah, he's going to be someone that I think is one of those you look at as a free transfer. I think it makes a lot of sense. I do. I think in football terms, as an option from the bench, I think he could be very dangerous, especially late in games. You know, he'll work with Postacoglu, he'll be working with, with no disrespect to other clubs, but a higher standard of certainly attackers. Um, in Sonny and Kane um, and like I say if he can get the assists and his ability to create to a higher level then you know he could be a very useful signing and I guess if you want to look from it from a slightly more cynical business point of view bringing in a player for free who even if it doesn't work out from this summer you could probably then sell for 5-10 million it does kind of make sense but I do think he can, he can make an impact obviously you've lost Lucas and Danjuma um and he comes in with Premier League experience, Champions League experience. I don't think as another option from the bench, he's, he's bad at all. Um, yeah, so looking at the remainder of the transfer window, I think we kind of need to explain exactly how Spurs operate in the transfer window. 
not the way that frustrates everyone, but the overriding plan that they enter a transfer window with. So there's two strands, two main objectives. The first main objective for Spurs in any transfer window is priority targets. So you heard me say a month or two ago, whatever it was, priority targets for this window, a goalkeeper, two centre-backs, um, a central attacking midfielder, and a uh, young winger type. So obviously, Vicario, new goalkeeper. Madison, the new attacking central midfielder. Lana Solomon, you could, oh, he, I kind of guess he could be that young winger. Um, he could also fall into the category of opportunities, which is something they also look at. And that is the next category. So the second objective in any transfer window for Spurs is to identify potential young stars for the first team and secure them kind of quite quickly and quietly without other people knowing. Good examples in the past have been Udogi, uh, Papa Natasar. Often they're kind of players that they end up loaning back as well to develop, just so purely they can get them in early because they know in the future they can become something special. Um, and that can also include opportunities that suddenly arise like Mana Solomon. Um, so they're the main two ones. But there is also technically a third strand as well to a transfer window, which is simply replacing players that leave in areas of the squad where you don't quite have that depth. So a good example is Pierre-Emil Hoybier this summer, who there's interest from Atletico Madrid, some from Germany as well. I know Bayern had a little bit of an interest in him as well. And from what I understand, Hoybier would be open to a to a move to to play it in the Champions League next season, I do wonder whether at this stage where with two years left in his contract, fan base are kind of split on him. You know, there's some people that think he's quite important in the midfield. He's, he's a leader, a um, bit of an organizer in there, and there's some people that will always think, well, he's kind of a, a jack of all trades and a master of none because of the way he, he plays the game. Um, probably doesn't fit a Postacoglu system as well as some of the other midfielders. I do feel like last season he really improved his attacking output. So maybe... So if you're not aware, the midfield three in a Postacoglu system, you've got a uh, number six pivot player, and you've got... He either plays with two number eights who get box-to-box -box and support the striker, or he'll play with a number eight and a kind of a hybrid midfielder who's somewhere between a six and an eight. Some of them kind of a seven. Um, but I suppose Hoybier could play that hybrid role, maybe, but maybe isn't as naturally fitting of the the hub kind of player, um, the pivot player, or maybe of the attacking number eight player. Whereas someone like Basuma played as number six at Brighton very well, also played at number eight at times. I'm still waiting to see whether he grabs the number eight shirt that Winks has left. You'd imagine he will. Benton Kerr, when he comes back, if he was talking about last month about coming back in two to three months, which would put him September, October. Benton Kerr, I can see him in either role, actually. He's very good under pressure of kind of bringing the ball out from the back. But he also, last year, became a real driving into the box, match winning kind of midfielder. So I can also see him doing the number eight role very well. Skippy, I can see as very much the number six pivot player. Tongi, probably more so the number six role, uh, but obviously would have to be very defensively disciplined in that. Could could maybe play the eight role, maybe the hybrid role, like I said about Hoybier. He would have to obviously have to add goals and assists to his games to be able to do that. Postacoglu is having a proper long look at Tongi um, to see, A, look, there's no debating his talent, but A, to see whether he fits his system, and B, just whether he's got, the, the drive and the character and mentality to be able to do what he wants from him. And obviously, this is not hammering Tongi. You know I'm one of his biggest fans and uh, uh, did set up the Tongi on the Melee Appreciation Society. But uh, every club he's been at, there have been questions about... Um, I guess it's just his drive and his desire and um, and then the desire to constantly be up and down and up and down the pitch, even at uh, Napoli last season. You know, Tongi is a Serie A title winner. He's come back being a title winner, but he the bulk of his games were from the bench. Uh, and there was one match where um, was it Spalletti, the manager, 
you could see him having a proper moan at him, even after I think it was a victory for not doing a bit of tracking back. Um, and it's just something that has dogged him throughout his career. Obviously, you could argue that Posokogu is going to be his first attacking manager since Poch, who desperately wanted to bring him in back in that glorious or then glorious summer of 2019, which hasn't proved to be so glorious since. But yeah, Posokogu will know quite quickly whether Tongi is for him or not. Um, and we'll see. I do feel like with Lo Celso, with the interest in him, is probably going to be one of the the players that is is out the door to to bring money in. And I think with Hoybier, look, they signed him for something like, what, 15 million? And Kyle Walker-Peters went in the opposite direction in a separate deal, which always sounds funny when they say that, because technically, a bit like Winks and Madison, yeah, it's separate, but of course it's kind of part of it when you look at it. Um, but yeah, what was I talking about? <laughs> talking about Harry Winks is completely taking me Oh, Tongi. Of course I was talking about Tongi. Um... Yeah, sorry, and the Now, Hoybier, that's what I was on. Hoybier. Hoybier, they're going to be looking for a fee that is way more than the 15 million they paid for him because that was when he had only a year left in his contract. He's got two years left, gives them more to play with. Um, and yeah, if Atletico want him, then they're going to have to pay the money for him. And then you kind of put that back into the squad. You know, I've said before, I we know that they I know that they they really like Conor Gallagher. Um and I know for some people that'll be like, oh, but Conor Gallagher is a young, talented player. He's got a lot of room and ceiling to develop and grow. It's a classic Spurs thing. And Spurs do need to also try and bring in some homegrown players. Um, they've got to make sure that they don't kind of neglect that side of things as well. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we shall see what happens with that. But I still do really feel that... You know, I was talking about them looking for young players and, and those little opportunities that arise. I wouldn't be stunned if we see one or two of those before the transfer window closes. I think they will get their priorities in. I think they will get two centre-backs over the line. I do believe that. Exactly who they are, we will see. But I do believe that you'll also see one or two young players, whether they end up being loaned back or not, or whether they end up being integrated into the squad straight away. I think Spurs just love to do those kind of deals. Ones that eventually will save them money in the long run and Spurs get a top kind of young player. Yeah, keep an eye out. Keep an eye out for those. They're the ones that kind of come out at the last minute and you didn't expect and then they're pretty advanced by the time we learn about them because they've tried to get it all done before the other big clubs can steal a march on them. Um, but yeah, centre-backs, well, we know kind of... It's, it's kind of quite clear. Unless something emerges from left field suddenly on the centre-back scenario uh, or an opportunity suddenly arises in the market. We know that it's a case now, really, of Spurs deciding, do they push through a move for Wolfsburg's Mickey van der Ven or do they push through a move for Bayer Leverkusen's Edmund Tapsoba? Um, they've got to fix that defence. 63 goals. <laughs> Even that number makes me shudder when you think about it, the amount of goals they conceded in the Premier League. Um the aim is to try to have a new centre-back in so that Postacogu can work with them on the tour. Um, hopefully that will be the case. Um, obviously we know um, the Van der Ven stuff, the Dutch media have really been kind of going strong on that, suggesting that everything is quite advanced with the player side of things and even claiming that Postacogu has already spoken to him. Oh, Postacoglu, he's been busy on the Zoom calls. We have Madison and Vicario saying that he's been speaking to them. He's obviously already spoken to Sonny. Um, they claim he's already spoken to Van der Ven. Um, it's quite interesting because you see stories come out from Germany about Daniel Levy being you know, furious that Harry Kane has kind of been tapped up in a way, I guess, and claims that Tuchel's spoken to Kane already. Obviously, Spurs wouldn't have given permission for that. But then you hear about these things where Postacoglu has spoken to people, and it's just... Clearly happens in football, doesn't it? It's very difficult to police, um, but it just is is a thing, isn't it? Um, I certainly know of transfer targets in the past that have spoken to former Spurs managers, and deals never happen. I know of them, but it, obviously you can't really do it because you are technically saying something dodgy was happening, so you can't really say exactly what it was. But it's the same anywhere. That's just what unfortunately, well, unfortunately, fortunately, 
maybe it's something that you just end up having to kind of make legal, but then it kind of makes a bit of a mockery of it because everyone be tapping up all over the place, but maybe they already are. I don't know. I don't have the answer to it. It's way beyond my understanding or pay grade. Um, pay grade, as if I'm involved in the business of football. Um, but yeah, Van der Ven. He is, if you're not aware, 22 years old. Obviously, Spurs have a very strong interest in him. He's understood to be very keen on the move, open to coming to Spurs. Six foot three, he's a big lad with incredible pace. If you haven't seen the viral video of him chasing back to make this amazing goal line block, he comes back from the, the opposition half. I have never seen such a big defender type move that quickly. Honestly, it's... They've done some kind of the metrics on him and his pace is right up there with kind of sprinters kind of speed. Uh, and is actually his ability on the ball. He's one of the most efficient passes. I think he was top for Wolfsburg in the Bundesliga in terms of successful passes. Um, he fits the Postacoglu system very well. Obviously, if they're going to play high up the pitch, he's going to be able to sprint back and get there. And you get the impression that if he comes in, despite the fact he is a raw talent, he would likely be a starter because of the balance he brings in being left-footed. He can play as a left-back as well. He's got the ability to motor forward with the ball. Him and Romero side by side, um, you can see how they would work together with that balance. Interestingly, one of the things that he said about him, despite the fact he's six foot three, is that his aerial ability has to improve. That is one of the areas where he does get beaten and that has to be worked on, especially in the Premier League. There's going to be a lot of physical aerial stuff so that's an interesting aspect to it as well. Um, talk that he's going to be around the £30 million pound mark. Um, certainly as of filming this, you know, with these videos, sometimes things happen immediately afterwards. Um, but as of recording this, there had been no deal agreed with Wolfsburg. There's an element to this. Look, you heard me say about how... Um, Fabio Pratici I revealed this a couple of weeks back. Fabio Pratici is still involved with Spurs on a consultancy basis. Uh, perhaps becomes even more important with Scott Munn not being able to officially start. But there's an element with Van der Ven and Tapsoba that reminds me of, you have heard me say many times before, of how Pratici would try to get various deals towards almost a conclusion and then decide which they were going for. And it kind of feels a bit like this. So Tapsoba... Um, you know, they, Spurs will have had talks over both of them. Uh, with Tapsoba, he is um, probably more ready-made than Van der Ven is. Uh, certainly got more experience. I think he's played 100 Bundesliga matches compared to Van der Ven's 38. Burkina Faso International, um, Van der Ven is not played for the senior Na uh, Netherlands team yet. He's an under-21 international Um I think Liverpool have shown some interest in him. Whether they push that through at all is another thing. Uh, but yeah, Tapsoba is probably the more ready-made player. He's 24 years old, two years older as well. However, that's reflected in his price. And it is talk that he could be around the £50 million pound mark. Um, so you've got that. And then you've also got, um, I've told you before, that I know Spurs are really, really like uh, Tosin Adarabayo as well. The Fulham defender is 25-year-old. Manchester-born centre-back. He also ticks plenty of boxes as well. He's a homegrown player. Final 12 months of his deal. Uh, there's been talk that maybe he could be around the 15 million mark, maybe slightly less. So as Guesty, who I do the podcast with, um, pointed out, you could end up, you could get Van der Ven and uh, Adarabayo um, for roughly the same figure that you could get just taps over for. So you kind of see you're fixing two sections of your defence with the same money that taps over would cost. But again, it's it's whether you then want to go all out for a player that you feel is slightly more ready-made. Um, yeah, it's... We will see. We will see who they, they press the green button on. Whether another one, a Sunday opportunity arises, a defender they didn't expect to be available suddenly becomes available. Um... There is also the Clement Longley situation. Joan Laporta, the Barcelona uh, president, said in the week that he expects to reach an agreement with Tottenham for Clement Longley to join permanently. I think it's still undecided from the Spurs' point of view whether they are going to kind of bring him back. Obviously, it remains an option. Like I said, again, the strategy spinning the plates, 
there's technically there's four defenders there that they could probably move for if they wanted. Uh, they've just got to decide which kind of probably two out of that four you they're looking for. You could maybe argue that could there be a scenario where they go for three? You'd have to have a real gutting of the defence, wouldn't you? Spurs are open to offers for Joe Roden, Davinson Sanchez, Jaffet Tanganga. Eric Dyer has made it very clear, it seems, that he doesn't want to go anywhere. He wants to. I know he's only got 12 months left, but he feels like fully fit that he can really make an impact under Postacoglu. Um, obviously, we'll see if there were a big bid comes in for him uh, or a decent-sized bid, whether Spurs would... <sighs> would look to try to change his mind on that or not. It's a difficult one because the other thing with if you lose Hoybier and Lloris, we're going to talk about in a little moment as well. I was looking at this, you know, that leadership group. You've got Hoybier, Lloris, Kane and Dyer. So Lloris and Hoybier going, or potentially going. Um, Kane, 12 months left on his deal, linked with a move. Dyer, 12 months left on his deal. You're kind of ripping out any experience and leadership. Look, I know people have different views on, oh, but are they a good influence? Are they a good leadership group? You still need some kind of leadership within your kind of squad. Um, and, yeah, it. Look, I don't really want to get into the Eric Dyer debate because people have very heated opinions on it. Me, personally... If I were to say for him to remain as a squad option with his experience, I don't think that's the worst thing in the world at all. Like I say, I I would imagine if they were to get either Van der Ven or Tapsoba, one of those would end up becoming the first choice alongside Romero. That's my belief. Having Eric Dyer as a backup with his Premier League experience and knowledge and fully fit, not carrying a groin injury for much of the season, I would imagine he would be better. Um, you know, he had a good season the season before last, that people kind of glossed over a bit, but he did have a good season on the whole under Conte um, and started really well under Nuno as well. But again, it's a whole debate. I know there's very heated views on it. Very People get very emotional about Eric Dyer. Um, but we'll see. We'll see how things shake up in the wash and, and who goes, who doesn't go. I would imagine Davinson Sanchez and Joe Roden definitely do. Uh, Tanganga, it's whether you keep him for the homegrown angle, but then you've got Adarabayu as well, who Bayo, who comes in as a homegrown player. Because don't forget, sorry to get nerdy, but whereas in European football, you've got different kinds of homegrown. You've got club trained and association trained. In the Premier League, doesn't matter. It's all the same. You're homegrown just if you've played in the country, if you've played the required amount of years, you've, you've come from the country. Um, so, yeah. And with Tanganga, if I'm Jaffet Tanganga, I do not stick around. I'm sorry, but he's played so little football. He needs to go and play football somewhere. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a very different backline. Let's be honest. You've got Destiny Doggy coming in as well, who's going to fight with, um, you'd reckon, Ben Davies on that left. We'll see what happens with Ryan Sessegnon. Essentially with Sess, he's got to prove to everybody, and mostly himself, that his hamstrings can handle the Premier League and everything that comes with it and what you need to do uh, on a day-in, day-out basis. It just I feel so sorry for him because there's a lot of talent there and always has been, but he's just been ravaged by these hamstring problems. And I'm told it continuously it's different hamstring muscles within the group of muscles, but he just keeps pulling them. And I wonder whether... I was about to say whether another loan, like a Hoffenheim loan he had, would be good for him. But you kind of get into that stage now, whether it's, is it kind of make or break rather than another loan? I don't know. We'll see with Cess. But you'd imagine that with a doggy coming in there, um, speaking to kind of those around the player and those who know him, there's no real fear that he'll be able to play as a left back, having been a wing back at Udinese, that he's done it for the, the national side. Um, and he's you know, he's only 20, that he's, he's going to be absolutely fine playing as left back. He's got to improve his defending a bit because he's a young player. That's what they all have to do when they're that age. But I don't think there's any worry. And, and with Ben Davies as the kind of older mentor type, again, I know some people have a thing in about Ben Davies, but I actually think, again, as an experienced head to guide a doggy, I don't think that's the worst thing at all in the world. 
I'd imagine Regulon Spurs. Well, I know the Spurs will listen to offers for him. Um, and you'd imagine you'd get something. It's a difficult. One. Last season wasn't the greatest advert for him because he had loads of injury problems at the start of the season, which was an injury he kind of came with from Spurs. I think it was a hamstring one as well, I think. Then he had real kind of a stomach problem that put him in hospital. And he didn't play many games for Real, uh, Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid. So, yeah, it wasn't the greatest advert for him. But I'd imagine some teams in Spain will still look at him and think, OK, well, there's, there's a deal to be done. Maybe with him it would be a loan with an option rather than a, a straight sale. Uh, it, it would depend what they could get for him. Even Perisic, of course, I've said this kind of for a while now, we expect him to leave to split um, quite literally, uh, I know he's been linked with Hadjuk split uh, and a return to Croatia. Um, it'd be interesting to see with him and Lloris because obviously Lloris is, uh, we know he's publicly said he wants to head off. I've seen today the, the Inter Milan stuff has really ramped up. There's a certain kind of irony to the fact that Inter, if Anana was going to go, wanted to replace him with Vicario, and in, in the end, they're actually going to replace him with the player that Vicario is succeeding at Tottenham well if they do it's, the indications are that they're going to make a move for Lloris but what's it really interesting is that I keep hearing about Perisic and uh, Lloris is that perhaps Spurs are going to end up having to kind of pay them off pay off like an agreement like a certain um, amount of their remaining contract come to an agreement that wouldn't be the full amount but would be a certain amount which I kind of find weird than that let's say Inter do come in for Lloris you know Inter Milan are, are, not a, are not a poor club. They are, you know, a club that ha have a decent amount of money. I know Italian clubs aren't awash with money, but you would imagine they'd be able to get somewhere near his wages. Um, and then he's not free. He's not, he does have, as in, sorry, he's not out of contract. He's got 12 months left in his contract. I find it odd that Spurs would have to pay any kind of substantial amount of money towards Lloris more so that Inter would come in. I don't know. Do you see what I'm, I'm trying to say? It seems odd that you'd have to pay off a player that there is interest in. I've seen, you know, we've seen it with um, Serge Aurier, uh, that obviously ended up having to kind of have his contract paid off and then later on he joined the club. But when there are actually interested clubs, it seems a really strange way of going about it. So when we eventually find out what happens with Perisic and Lloris and where they end up going, I'm definitely going to drill into those deals and try and find out a bit more because... It would seem mad for it to cost Spurs money to get players out the door who other clubs want. I can understand that maybe you'd pay to reflect a, a gap in salary because Premier League clubs do pay very well. And Perisic and Larissa are two of Spurs' bigger earners. But you'd imagine that with the if there's an absence of a of a fee, that maybe even there's an agreement that the buying club give the player are bigger on signing on fee to replace. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a financial type, but it just seems odd to me. Um, so on the right, looks like it's going to be Porro and Emerson, doesn't it? For Jed Spence, I would imagine we're looking at probably a loan scenario here. Um, I don't think if Spurs were to try and sell him, not saying that they would want to, but I think I don't think you're going to get your money back right now. I think it would make more sense to loan him somewhere to get his value up. Personally, I spoke about it just a moment ago with Session on a Hoffenheim type loan for Spence, I think would be massive for him. Uh, it didn't quite work at Ren, but I could see him maybe going to somewhere like the Bundesliga and absolutely tearing it up there. And then he comes back more confident frame of mind, having played football similar to the Premier League, and his value goes up from a cynical point of view as well. I suppose did want to try and sell him then his value has gone up. Whereas, I don't know, at this point in time, whether it's a case where he waits until January um, and then maybe doesn't gets a loan there like he did last season, I don't know, because obviously you could get an injury to Poro or Emerson. Um, but yeah, I just feel like at this point in time, it would look like he's still third choice. Um, Poro, obviously, is going to have to adapt to being a fullback. Um, Postacoglu obviously will have a, a slightly more attacking sense with his fullbacks. He also could play as the winger up there, um, you know, because you could have, uh, let's say, uh, Kulusevski could end up playing in a number eight role 
um, it has the potential to do that, in which case you could maybe put Poro up there as a, a winger who could also act in a more defensive uh, way as well. So, and, and Emerson obviously is just, when it comes to being a natural right back, you're going to see a lot more of the best of Emerson Royale in that sort of position. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm really intrigued to see what happens with a few of those as well. And we've got Brian Hill as well. You know, what happens with him? Personally, I think he fits Postacoglu's system really well, but does he want to go back to Spain? Um, I'm hoping, obviously, we'll head off in a week's time off to Perth. I'm hoping to kind of grab interviews with a lot of these players. Hopefully Spurs won't hide them away and we can kind of find out a little bit about their intentions and what they want to do. Um, oh, a little quote I had down I thought was interesting. Postacoglu spoke about Madison and Vicario and why he wanted to sign them. He said, it's not just about the talent they bring as footballers, it's what they bring as people as well, because we're going to go play football that requires a certain type of personality and character. Both those guys have got it in abundance. I could hear it in their voices when I spoke to them. I had a couple of chats with both of them before we signed them, and I knew that they were the right types to bring into the dressing room. Part of the driver is that if I can see that in them, that this is their preferred destination for the right reason, that's enormous. I could sense with both of those guys that this was the case. And that gives you a sense of what Postacoglu not only wants from the new signings, but also what you expect from the players at the club. So you've got to prove that to him. So if you're a player, let's say, if you're getting down about the fact that you're not likely to play many minutes, or if you're going to be a bit of a sulker, or someone that's not going to give 100% to try and prove someone wrong, then you're not going to make it. You're not going to be a Postacoglu player. It's why someone like Skippy, I can imagine Postacoglu really liking him. Okay, because he is... He's obviously tactically very intelligent, but he's also a 100% kind of player. He will give you everything until his legs fall out off. He will run himself into the ground for you. Um, and I can imagine Postacoglu really relishing working with, with Skippy. Um, obviously, Skippy's still so young. He's only 22. He's got so much developing himself to do. Um, I've seen some, player, some people already writing him off. He's like, no, he's 22. You know I like Skippy, but come on. You've got to have some balance. He's got so much more to, to kind of come from his career as well. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I've been really impressed with what I've been he hearing about Postacoglu from those who've been working with him. And I've been really impressed with hearing what he's got to say. But ultimately, it's, it's in the doing rather than the talking. And that's what's going to come with him as well. Um, he's got to make a lot of changes at Spurs. It's got to be a, a really different feel to Spurs going forward. Um, and that's again why I'm really looking forward to the tour because I think we're going to get a lot better sense of what kind of a Tottenham Hotspur are like uh, under Postacoglu. You can feel the vibes when you're on the tour. Like back in 2019 uh, out in Shanghai and Singapore, amazing experiences, but you could feel the frustration around Spurs from Poch as well. It wasn't the greatest mood. Um, under Conte last year, there was a feeling, of, there was a bit of hope. There was. Um, there was a more of a, a hope of what the season would bring. And unfortunately, that very quickly dissipated as you could, as the season went on. And under Postacoglu, we'll, we'll soon get a sense of... Because he will only take the players that he wants to take. This is the thing. He has to make a lot of decisions by the time uh, the team fly out next Friday. He needs to make a lot of decisions there. Because there's no point taking someone on tour that doesn't want to be at the club... Um, and he doesn't believe will be part of his long-term plans. Any of those fringy types that might move on elsewhere, but we don't know yet, will go on the tour so you can have a last look at him. But you'll, you'll definitely have a list of players that don't come with because we know they're heading off elsewhere. And that will be, I'm trying to think if anyone has ever survived that, as it were. If anyone has been left on that list of sticking around and not, and then played a part in the season, I don't think they have. And we'll also get a sense of what young players will go. You know, will Matthew Craig go? Alfie Devine, Dane Scarlett, Troy Parrott. Um, who else? Niall John, maybe. Iago Santiago had a really good season as well. Look, players like this. Um, I'm intrigued to see how many he takes, you know. I'd imagine it'll be slightly more than the normal 25-man squad. Maybe you'll see 26, 27, 28, maybe. Um, just so he can bring in more youngsters to give them the experience of working with him and he can have a little look at them as well. Um, yeah, yeah, it's in interesting to see what comes and, and really looking forward to it. Um, 
Just before I go, I wanted to thank people for something completely different. I wanted to thank people that listen to the podcast I do with Guesty, Golden Guest Talk Tottenham. Um, I know not everyone that watches these will listen to that, but some people might. I just want to say thank you. If you haven't caught this one, uh, this week's episode, I also thank people as well, because we found out our listener figures this week. And it's really weird. Is When I do these YouTube videos, I know how many of you watch them. And I'm so incredibly grateful for it. But I instantly know who's watching it and how many. Um, with our podcast, we didn't really know until this week. We kind of had a rough idea. Some people said about certain figures, but it was never... We were never getting this grand sense of the whole picture of how many were listening. Um, and we found out this, this week that hundreds of thousands each month are listening to the podcast and we're so incredibly grateful and humbled by it because we were only talking about it a couple of weeks ago guesty and i that we kind of felt like maybe what if we're only talking to like 12 people and most of them are our family <laughs> we just we just enjoy ourselves is it we have a little bit of chat back and forth um we take the mickey out of each other um guesty hates my kind of dad jokes and puns and stuff and and I kind of deliberately do that. He doesn't like movies. I like movies. And he absolutely never gets my movie references. And, and we have a lot of fun. So to actually hear that that many people each month are listening to us. Cause, and don't forget, we only do it once a week, our podcast as well. It is literally once a week. Yet so we've got hundreds of thousands listening each month. It's incredible. And we're so grateful for it. So I just want to say thank you. Just in case anyone hadn't listened to this week's podcast. And also, it's I am constantly having to say this in the comments. People often asking, oh, can't you do the podcast version of this? And I understand that's probably helpful not to see my face, but also helpful in a sense that maybe I think it's easier to listen to on the go. So I do really appreciate people that, that watch this. But my answer every time is that I already have this podcast, Golden Guest Talk Tottenham with Guesty. I don't really want to be in competition with it uh, in any way. There's no real need because I already have this existing in that sphere and I have this existing in this sphere. Uh, this sphere. So, um, yeah, it was just a thank you, just in case anyone didn't hear it on the podcast or in case anyone else wanted a podcast to listen to. It's we kind of touch on different things. There's some little bits of crossover, but it's often recorded on a different day. So you get more. This might be have an immediate reaction to something that's happened today, like Scott Munn stuff, the ticket prices stuff, things like that. Um, and whereas the podcast might be a more immediate reaction to something else and yeah, there's little areas we go into that are different as well. And I guess it's just something you can listen to on the go. So, uh, yeah, just a big thank you. And to be honest, a massive thank you for, for those who watch these YouTube videos because we're very close. Uh, I'm very close. We're very close to breaking the 10 million um, views on this channel, which is mad. For a guy that just sits here on this sofa, chats away about Tottenham Hotspur, I honestly, I never will never ever uh, underappreciate how wonderful that is and how lucky I am that people do that. It's it's lovely. You know what I say, this is therapy for me in a way. I love, it's cathartic for me to talk about Tottenham. And the fact that I obviously have uh, access and my job allows me to kind of give you a bit of a more rounded insight into things that happen within Tottenham Hotspur, that's, that's an absolute pleasure to be able to deliver to you. Um, and yeah, I can't believe 10 million views. It's absolutely mad. We're almost there. I think it's about, I think maybe the next couple of videos, if they're the usual amount that they're, they're get, currently getting, I think that will take us over the 10 million, which is just incredible. And honestly, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. And I will be doing these on the tour. Don't worry. I'll uh, probably try and fit in two or three during the tour. Obviously, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to pack everything like this new fancy light that i have around the the phone or not uh i can i can see that in it getting broken in my suitcase but whatever happens i will be doing some kind of uh videos out there as well so uh yeah there'll be another one hopefully uh before i head off on the tour because i'm sure we'll have more to talk about next week i get that feeling but uh yeah so we had some highs and lows positives and negatives in this one ticket price is definitely a negative um scott munn stuff not great and uh interesting to see who the third friendly will be against if roma do pull out uh but lots of positive with postacoglu and hopefully with the transfers to come in the next seven to ten days or so so yeah let's see where they go 
and yeah, I'm going to head off now. As always, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Goodbye. <laughs>